Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Morality is Hard podcast. This is Michael Delayakovo. Today is a special episode because it's the first episode back in over a year. I'm very nearly finished with my PhD, so I'm excited to be getting back into projects I love, such as this podcast. And I'm aiming to have a new episode with a new interesting guest at least once a month. Today, I will be interviewing the Honourable Emma Hurst, a member of the New South Wales Legislative Council, known as the Upper House, and elected representative of the Animal Justice Party. Before we get into that, I want to talk about a few things that came to mind recently. If you're just here for my interview with Emma, please skip ahead. Otherwise, uh, stick around and enjoy. Just skip ahead to about five minutes and 10 seconds. First is a thought experiment posed to me by a friend, Tim Ambrose, that I found really insightful. So the question is, would you rather have the most fun holiday possible, but you don't remember it after, or a decent holiday, but you do remember it? So let's say that option one is 10 times more fun than option two, which would mean something like you'd prefer to have option one just once over having option two nine times, assuming you would actually remember them both. It's just that much more fun. The question at play here is how much enjoyment do we get from holidays from the experience itself? And how much enjoyment do we get from the memory, which is a more slower burning but longer lasting enjoyment? The answer to this question probably varies between people. I made a poll with this question on Twitter The sample size was 17 people, and it's of the biased subset of the population, that is my followers, so take this with the appropriately sized fist of salt. 71% of people who responded said they'd prefer the decent holiday. One commenter actually expressed surprise that even 29% of people would prefer the best holiday but forget scenario, and went on to say, there didn't seem to be any point of having a good time if it didn't become a memory. I have two problems with this line of thinking as compelling as it might be initially. One is that we will all die one day and have no memories. Does that mean that nothing we do in life matters? I'd argue that it is still good to create pleasure and still wrong to cause suffering regardless because it matters at the time. My other objection is best explained if we flip the scenario. Would you prefer a little bit of pain, but you remember it forever, or excruciating pain, but you forget about it? For me, the answer is quite clearly to remember the little pain. I couldn't justify causing anyone to experience excruciating pain, even if they forget about it. Imagine a scenario where someone is about to die and you have the option to first cause them excruciating pain. Is it morally neutral to cause them the pain because they're about to die and forget about it? Well, clearly not. To go back to the hypothetical, the main point I'm trying to make is that we shouldn't discount how good an experience would be just because we won't remember it. Memories are part of what make holidays good, but it's far from the only part. I'd happily take the best holiday ever and forget about it over a decent holiday that I remember forever. My second musing, the more I learn about what some non-human species are capable of, the more horrified I become at the atrocity that is non-human suffering, both human-caused and natural. For example, dogs with their sense of smell bats with their echolocation, and birds with their seeming ability to navigate using magnetic fields in a similar way to how we would navigate using optical light. They perceive things in ways that we can't really imagine, even once we can express the concept. We can't really put ourselves in that position. Is it really so strange to think that some non-human species might have a greater capacity to suffer than us, despite being less intelligent in the ways we usually think of as intelligence? Imagine wallowing in a cramped metal stool where you can barely move, you have infections, and you're suffering organ failure, but it's 100 times worse. It's time we accept just how little we know about the inner lives of non-humans and start giving them the benefit of the doubt. Maybe we should take their suffering as seriously or more seriously than humans. This concept that non-humans might actually suffer more than humans was first brought to my attention by... Uh, the cosmic skeptic, who suggested that because of evolutionary pressures, humans might have evolved less capacity for suffering because we don't need it as much because of our intelligence. But other non-humans, other animals who didn't develop that intelligence had more of a need for suffering 
as a way of uh, as a tool for survival. So it seems reasonable to think that non-humans, at least some of them, might have developed more of a capacity for suffering. Let's get on to the interview. So I'll introduce Emma Hurst and then we'll get into it. So the Honourable Emma Hurst, MLC, was elected to the New South Wales Legislative Council in 2019, the second member of the Animal Justice Party to be elected to New South Wales government. She is a registered psychologist and has worked for several animal protection organisations. Since being elected, she has been working on legislation to help animals in New South Wales. In our chat, we got into some interesting questions and some tricky issues, so I really hope you'll enjoy the interview. Without any further ado, here's Emma Hurst. So I'm joined now by Emma Hurst. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Something I've noticed uh, in these kinds of discussions around ethics or when we're talking about the right thing to do uh, is people sometimes think they're disagreeing about facts, but really they're disagreeing about the underlying ethics. So in other words, they're not disagreeing about things like statistics or what is true. They're disagreeing about what matters. So I like to start these kinds of conversations by having all parties state their um, their ethical frameworks that they use to make decisions about how to improve the world. Um, so for example, I'll start. Uh, so I'm a total hedon- hedonistic utilitarian. I think that all conscious minds matter, suffering is bad, well-being is good, and that anything, everything else matters only as much as it, uh, as, as far as it creates less suffering and more well-being for conscious minds. So Emma, if I could start with uh, asking you, what ethical values drive you? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, and it, it's interesting the way you talk about the underlying ethics rather than facts and and the way that there's almost this perception, you know, people say, oh, these are your beliefs. And, you know, I don't believe that animals are terrified in slaughterhouses. They are terrified in slaughterhouses. These are facts, as you say. Um, but I don't really follow any kind of, well, not consciously, a, a, a specific framework. Um, but what I am quite aware of Um, is is not really turning a blind eye. Um, I think that, you know, when you say it's it's about disagreeing about what matters, I think that people do care about animals. I think people care a lot. Um, And and I guess this is going into my psych background, but that there's this cognitive dissonance, um, you know, this, this desire to find a state of calm and a state of peace and so we block certain information out. Um, and when we're confronted with certain information that makes us feel uncomfortable, there's an automatic human reaction to try to get rid of that feeling as quickly as possible, um, whether that's turning a blind eye or creating excuses around what they've heard or what they know to be fact. So I guess the ethical value that kind of drives me is to really remain aware of exactly what is happening um, and so that we can create change in that. So making sure I'm aware of cognitive dissonance um, and avoiding that wherever possible because I know that the only way we're going to be able to create change is by accepting the truth and accepting reality um, and then trying to work out a way around that. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. And you mentioned your psych background, which I'm excited to come back to a little bit later, um, but just for now, so you uh, mentioned your values and um, what drives you, I guess. And so following on from that, uh, how did that lead you to run for public office instead of um, the, you could have done anything else, I guess? Uh, what what led you to do that, uh, to pursue that in terms of pursuing a, a career in defense of animals? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I, my my connection to animals goes all the way back to when I was a really young child and we had some rescue cats and, and I grew a very, very close bond to, to these cats and I actually recall sitting with a hen once in my lap and the hen was purring in the same way as my cat purrs and I realised that if I couldn't eat my cat, then I couldn't eat this hen. Um, so it seemed like a very sort of natural progression for me um, and so I knew at that moment that, you know, I wanted to work to protect animals um, I started writing letters to my parents saying that I wanted to go vegetarian. It was many years later that I found out about the cruelty that happened in the dairy industry and the egg industry um, and, and then went vegan and realised that, you know, this is a much bigger issue than I had even first considered. Um, but, but I guess it also comes back to this whole idea that there's really three areas of change that we need to um, address in regards to animal protection. And, and that's individual change, corporate change, 
and political change. And, and I've worked in all three areas. So I've worked in some of that individual change. So encouraging people to change their behaviours to behaviours that are more animal friendly, um, convincing corporations to change their policies, um, their own ethical framework that they work within. Um, and then, of course, that, that, that political change. And I guess why I ran for public office um, was really looking at all those three areas um, and recognising that we need to achieve change in all areas to be able to get to where we need to be in the fastest way possible. And I could see that individual change um, was happening quite rapidly, that there was a lot of people, um, you know, spending a lot of their personal time going to the street, educating people, talking to people, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. There's fantastic documentaries out there. There's organisations like Animals Australia that are doing fantastic work um, with various corporations to make sure they have animal-friendly policies, and yet there was this huge void in that political change. And so the, one of the reasons I, I ran for public office was because I asked myself, you know, where am I best placed to help animals? And seeing this big gaping hole in that sort of political space uh, made me realise that, you know, it was a big uphill battle for, in, in, in that political space, but really something had to happen in that space because, you know, we, we obviously need change first in individual or corporate change before we can achieve political change. Um, but, like, to give you one example of, of if we just focus on individual and corporate change and we don't have that extra focus on the political change, we can see things happening like, uh, subsidies going to prop up industries. So where consumers are making ethical choices to no longer consume products that harm animals, um, if the government of the day decides to prop up that industry and continue to allow it to run and using our taxpayers' money, um, it, 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 it just makes those sort of three areas really interconnected. And so that's why we need change in all three areas to get to where we need to be in the fastest way possible. Yeah, and I'm really glad you mentioned that example. I um, wanted to bring that up a little bit later, but I think it's a good example of how if we just focused on the individual change, we can start to get this pushback on other levels uh, that yeah we need to be ta we need to be addressing there as well. I guess some other examples might be things like ag gag laws and banning the use of words like milk or mincemeat to describe plant based products that um, probably are coming up in part because of the success of the individual. Um, as the uh, individual change aspect. Absolutely. Um, I was just going to say, um, and, and that's really just because we've started the debate um, and, you know, like it, it, all this sort of stuff was all happening undebated for a very long time. And, and so the reason why we're seeing this real heavy pushback is because that debate has started. Yeah, and uh, I, I know there's been a lot of talk recently in the effective animal advocacy space about individual versus institutional change, and you went even further to break institutional, I guess, down into corporate and political as two separate parts of that, which makes sense. Uh, and, yeah, I guess the institutional change sounds like it is a lot more neglected at the moment. So, yeah, I think it's, yeah, I would agree it's important to um, put my focus on that. So, yeah, uh, next I want to talk about um, your work in Parliament. So last week was the first sitting week of Parliament uh, for New South Wales government, if I'm not mistaken, Correct. this year. Uh, and it's I, I know it was a busy one for, for you and for your fellow um, representative from AJP, Mark Pearson, just from what I've uh, seen on Facebook. Um, so could you please tell us about the issues that you've both been working on uh, and focusing on at the moment and why you think they're important? So what, one of the big ones that we started focusing on last year, which um, is still ongoing within Parliament, was tougher penalties for acts of animal cruelty. So in New South Wales, an act of animal abuse um, has a maximum fine of $5,500. Um, compared to other states and territories around, this, around Australia, we're one of the lowest. So in Victoria, I think it's nearly 40000 at the maximum and in Western Australia, I think it's roughly 50,000. And what, what it indicates when you've got a fine of $5,500, it indicates that animal cruelty is a low-level uh, low crime, and it, it's absolutely not. It's a very, very serious crime, and we need our penalty systems really to reflect that. 
So this is something that we were pushing heavily last year. We ended up tabling our own legislation on the issue. In response to that, the minister tabled his own legislation. So that's now passed in the um, in the other house, in the lower house last week. Um, but now it will come to our house in March in our next sitting week. So that's been a really big one. Um, the other ones that have come to us um, was strata. So we ended up passing an amendment to strata bylaws. And while, while strata management schemes wasn't a major priority for the Animal Justice Party, what happens is we can often put up amendments to government bills. And so that's how this one came up, is that the government had their own piece of legislation they wanted passed and we put up an amendment. And that was really about ensuring that animals could remain in their homes with their families. And it was actually a much bigger issue than I had realised and, and until I actually took it on. There was issues of, of retrospective bylaws where people who had been living in their homes that they owned um, and then a strata committee would create a new bylaw of no animals and people were being told during COVID to sell their apartment and move out or get rid of their animal, um, which is just an absolutely horrific situation for anyone to have to, to deal with. Um, but it was also connected with um, housing, um, a people, ability for people to find housing in domestic violence situations, there was also situations where strata committees were um, working against the Disability Discrimination Act where people had companion animals. So it, it, it was really quite complex. And so we passed an amendment last year um, that got further amended this week in the other, in the other house uh, by Alex Greenwich, and then that came through to us uh, last week as well. So that's now passed. Um, I also tabled some legislation um, around cephalopods and crustaceans. So these animals aren't even considered animals in our law. Um, I mean, it just sounds absolutely absurd. And anybody that's seen the documentary, My Octopus Teacher, um, you know, every, everybody's commenting about it on my Facebook page because they can't believe that there's not even the very basics. I mean, our, our Protection of Cruelty to Animals Act, if you've had a look at it, it's, it's pretty basic. It's very poor. It's really outdated. There are exemptions for all sorts of cruel acts, um, but then there's certain animals that just aren't even in there at all, um, including uh, cephalopods and crustaceans. So we put up an amendment and read, uh, did the second reading of our piece of legislation. So that, that can go to debate um, in another sitting week. And my colleague, Mark Pearson, uh, put up a piece of legislation around the cruelty in regards to the horse racing industry, um, the use of whips and tongue tying um, and, and some of those um, specifically cruel acts that happened within the horse racing industry. Um, and so he, he did the second reading of that piece of legislation as well. So, I mean, look, there's, there's so many issues that, that we can and need to work on in Parliament. Um, it, it's often a very difficult decision to know what to prioritise. Um, and quite often it, for us it comes down to um, what can we achieve wins on um, and what really just needs to be tabled because we need to start the conversation somewhere. So we, we try to build into a, a mix of both. Yeah, yeah, there's definitely a big prioritisation issue, I'm sure, with um, trying to decide which issues to focus on. Uh, so you, there's also, I think, an issue that you uh, I saw you mentioned last week about um, crush videos and fetish videos, if I've got that right, of of um, people harming animals, which, uh, I mean, I just, I find it just astounding. Also that I, the fact, just the fact that I hadn't even really heard about that or considered it as an issue. And I mean, just looking at the, the faces of some of your colleagues in parliament behind you in the video, they seem to be pretty surprised as well. I think, I think many people would, would feel the same. So how is it that, that, that even, it, that issue even, I guess slips under the radar, so to speak. And you know, it's not something. It's something that almost no one in society would would agree with. So, is that maybe like a, a low hanging fruit? Those kinds of issues that people don't really think about, but almost everyone agrees with that we can we can tackle. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? 
Yeah, it, it's an interesting one because, I mean, crush videos actually came to my attention. I was looking through one of the animal law texts um, and I noticed that there was a sentence and I, I, I had known about crush videos several years ago um, in one of my campaigns when I was working within Animal Liberation and that came to my attention. I think that there were some media stories on that at the time. Now, actually doing the act of, of, of a crush video would be illegal, but it's one of those areas where, and I think that this is one of those things where people just weren't talking about animal issues in Parliament until the Animal Justice Party were elected. It was such a neglected area that there's so many, you know, you talk about this low-hanging fruit, it's almost like everything's low-hanging fruit because everything's been so neglected. It's almost like where do you start because there's so much of it. But this one, you know, really came to our attention because the US had introduced a whole lot of new laws, which, you know, made us realise that maybe we could get something done through here. But um, we actually asked a question about crush videos last year and the response given to us by government was that it does fall under this certain section of the Crimes Act, um, which says that you cannot publish indecent articles. So there's almost this belief that this is an issue that doesn't need to be dealt with. So that's the other area that we need. We often come up against. And so what we ended up doing was we hired an open source investigator um, independently who did some research to see how widely available these videos were to Australians. She found over 3,000 videos online very, very easily in the clear web. We're not talking about the dark web. We're just talking about general search terms. Um, and, that, you know, some of these websites, none of them were hosted in Australia, but some of them were clearly targeting Australians. They had the word Australia in the title. Um, I won't actually uh, put on any publication what the name of that website is, but um, th there was, it was obviously there was websites specifically targeting Australians, so there's obviously a, a market for it. And we also had a legal opinion put around the current laws around indecently publishing an article. And what, what we found from that legal opinion was that it, what the, the gap in our laws is really about selling, distributing um, and possessing these videos because that's not the same as actually publishing these videos. Um, and the people that are selling and possessing and distributing these types of graphic animal cruelty fetish videos are the same people usually that also have child pornography and various other horrific videos. So there, there's really a gap in the law there. We've really built a case around our argument. Um, and so we've put up the notice of motion. We do have a meeting with the Attorney General in a few weeks. And so hopefully we can show him that legal opinion. We can show him the open source investigations and show that there really is a gap in the law there. Um, and it will also help um, police who are prosecuting somebody, for example, who may have child pornography to give them extra offences if that person was to also have bestiality videos or crash videos on top of that. So there are a lot of issues like that, um, which I think have just been overlooked. Uh, and, you know, like last year we did a whole lot of work around the link between domestic violence and animal abuse and you know, groups like Lucy's Project have been working in that space for so many years, and yet um, animal abuse wasn't recognised until last year as a form of domestic violence. And so that was some of the work that we did with Lucy's Project and the government here with the Attorney General. Um, and now the legislation, the Crimes Act, recognises the link between domestic violence and animal abuse, recognises animal abuse as a form of domestic violence, um, and, and there was um, half a million also given to refuges to upgrade their facilities to be able to house animals, um, and animals are also now included explicitly on apprehended domestic violence orders. So, I mean, again, that seems like something so obvious, but it was just something that's been so overlooked for so long because nobody's been within the halls of parliament actually advocating for these changes. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, a gap in the legislation seems to be a recurring theme with um, animal issues in Parliament. Absolutely. Uh, um, so you are the Deputy Chair of the Portfolio Committee Number 4 Industry. Uh, among other things, this committee's portfolio includes agriculture and regional New South Wales. Uh, just before we talk about this, uh, I want to point out that 
Just in the last few weeks, uh, I saw that Jabari Brisport, who is a vegan first term uh, New York state senator, was elected to their state's ag committee. And Cory Booker, who is a U.S. senator for New Jersey, also vegan, was elected to the Committee for Agriculture and Nutrition. And I just I want to know, how, how does this keep happening? Because you would expect that um, they would be agitating the status quo in that committee, uh, and yourself included, but they were voted in. So how do these vegans keep getting into the agriculture committees? Look, I mean, I can only really sort of, I guess, speak from my own experience and when I first got elected, I, I just knew that it was so central to the work that I'm doing that I needed to try to get onto that committee. And for us, it, it all comes down to the numbers and it all comes down to talking uh, within parliament and, and talking with the people amongst the crossbench and with Labor to try to get those numbers to get onto these committees. So I need to get the support of the Greens, um, which, you know, generally for animal legislation is pretty easy, but now we're talking about a seat on a, on a committee. Um, that means that they would have to not put somebody up and to allow me to go on. So, you know, you end up just having a whole lot of um, bargaining and, and discussions. And, and, I mean, these discussions went on for, for several weeks and there was quite a lot of heated discussions, which is difficult when, you know, I had literally just been elected. But, you know, it was something that I knew that we could get the numbers to try to get on there. Um, based on the makeup of the upper house, um, and, and and we had to get one of us from the Animal Justice Party onto this because all farmed animal issues um, fall under this committee. Mm. And and what kind of work do you do on that committee? What what t- kind of issues have you been working on so far that um, you're excited about, or um, and what, what's what's next for that committee? So one of the big um, inquiries that we've done on that is the use of animals in entertainment. So that was one that I initiated within that committee. Um, So that report has come out. Now, the other thing as well with this committee is I'm very much outnumbered. Um, So there's three government members, um, including a National Party member. The chair is a Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party member. And then I've got two Labor. So... Even where I can get Labor on side, we're still outnumbered by one if the shooters and the government work together to block us on animal issues. Um, so even though we did the inquiry on the animals and entertainment, they voted down any kind of change in regards to getting animals out of out of circuses. But we did get some recommendations essentially to end um, more breeding of dolphins, for example, in, in entertainment. Um, so... Those all form recommendations as part of an inquiry. And and the other recommendation, which was pretty strong, was that the government consider feasibility studies to actually retire the last dolphins that are still being used in entertainment um, into a sea sanctuary. So those fairly strong recommendations came through in that report and um, and I'm still working with the government to try to see if we can get some of those um, into, into law, into regulations, into actual practice. Um, which would be another big change here in New South Wales. When the ag-gag legislation, which you mentioned briefly before, uh, came in through New South Wales, we made sure it got referred to the committee. Um, So we also reviewed the ag-gag legislation and and actually getting it through that inquiry um, quite significantly weakened the piece of legislation um, even though it's still an absolutely dreadful piece of legislation, it it did go much further originally. We've also been looking into the dairy industry. Now, this wasn't an inquiry that I put up. This was an inquiry that the shooters and the government wanted. Um, But just me being there and being a voice on that committee, we were able to get um, an ex-dairy farmer onto that inquiry who talked about her experience, the animal cruelty that's involved, the environmental destruction, the health, Uh, repercussions. There was also other vegan advocates that came and spoke at that inquiry and talked about those issues as well. And we talked about um, this whole idea of transformation. So instead of, so this whole inquiry was the dairy industry basically saying that that it's a collapsing industry, so therefore they need more government subsidies. But we were able to bring the argument through in that inquiry that instead of subsidising to prop up an industry that's already collapsing, 
what we should be doing is using those subsidies to help farmers tr transition out of the industry and into more popular plant-based industries. Um, so if we weren't on there, then that argument would never have been put forward. Um, and of course, all of our budget estimates go through. So we're just about to go into budget estimates. And this is the opportunity to actually sit down with the minister um, in camera and actually ask them questions. And so we'll be asking questions to um, the Deputy Premier, uh, John Barillaro, at the end of this week. We've got um, Adam Marshall next week as the Minister for Agriculture. Um, so that's some of the stuff that we do in that in that Agriculture uh, Committee. Great. Well, I'm really glad that you were able to get in that committee because it sounds like a lot of important work for animals goes through that committee. So that's that's excellent. Um, bit of a topic change. Your background is psychology. Mm -hmm. How do you think that informs the work that you do today? And are there any insights that you have from your background, um, your your degree or former roles from psychology that you think are relevant to um, your strategy in Parliament? Yeah, um, I mean, obviously, all the research and statistics is is really useful to be able to read and understand statistics. A lot of psych is, is statistic-based. Um, but I ended up doing my master's in health psychology, which was primarily focused around mass behaviour change. So health psychology looks at how do we get people to wear seatbelts? How do we get people to quit smoking? And so I wanted to grab some of those strategies and really pull it into animal advocacy. How do we get that mass mobilisation and tipping points for animal issues? So, yeah, it, it's really given me a lot of insight into how to work with people and also... I guess, kind of what strategies, because a lot of the work that I do isn't just within Parliament putting forward legislation and debating laws. A lot of the work we do is also, um, you know, bringing community on side with us and being able to pull that back into Parliament because everybody here thinks it with two hats. That One of their hats is the parliamentary work that they do and the other hat that they all wear is how will they get re-elected and what will happen based on the numbers in the next upcoming election. And so when we bring issues into Parliament and we popularise them and we highlight them and put the spotlight on it, then we can highlight certain parties as supporting a very popular issue, like um, Labor supporting us uh, to end puppy farming, for example. But we can also highlight any parties that aren't supporting us on legislation um, like the, the National Party is, is pushing back um, on puppy farming legislation, which is very popular with that sort of, um, you know, the, the general community really want to see this legislation pass. So um, part of what our work is is also still running those public-facing campaigns and working with different organisations that have worked in some of those spaces um, to really build momentum to get the legislation that we want to see passed. Great. Um, and yeah, your what you just said about p um, people in parliament wearing two hats, that that sometimes the, the, the aspect of people having to, at least to some extent, um, do what the people in their communities uh, or in, in the state want, kind of, it gives me a bit of a cynical view on politics sometimes. Um, but I, th I think, uh, yeah, what you just um, said there is, I guess, lean just leaning into that and yeah, trying to move the needle on what people care about and kind of attacking it from that way. So I think that's that's good. So I think it's, um, this is maybe a bit of a, a pessimistic part of the, the interview, but I think it's good practice though to be aware that sometimes our actions can, um, despite our best intentions uh, and efforts, they can sometimes have unfortunately negative unintended consequences. So just to give an example that I heard recently from Lewis Bollard, who works for Open Philanthropy, um, gave, which I'd found really compelling, a plausible scenario for a plausible scenario for causing harm accidentally with some uh, legislation might be to ban some animal product from being made in Australia or, or in any country. And then what happens is people end up importing that product from overseas where somewhere that might actually have lower animal welfare standards. So that would actually overall be um, potentially a bad outcome. So yeah, I guess the the question here is uh, how do you try and account for that and how does how does that risk inform your inform your decisions? Yeah, look, I think it's a really big one. 
Um, and particularly because in Australia, most of our laws are state-based. And so that that's, and it's also used as an excuse not to act as well. So, you know, when you talk about banning a certain practice or banning something in New South Wales, um, often the excuse is people will just get it from another state or it will help prop up the industry in another state. And certainly we're seeing it at the moment uh, with puppy farming, you know, Victoria, has banned puppy farming, um, WA is about to ban puppy farming. And so they're all flooding into New South Wales. Um, you know, they're, they're basically just packing up and moving into New South Wales where our weak laws don't really do enough to protect these animals. Um, I mean, I don't think that that's, in this case, a reason not to do something, but I, I do think we need to constantly think two steps ahead. And I think that the other aspect that we always need to really consider is every piece of legislation that we put up or every law that we put up can be undone. So, I mean, I mean I'm mean, i already thinking about, you know, in the next election, how do we get Labor to commit to getting rid of the ag-gag legislation if they get elected? Um, but the same can happen with our own legislation. So you've also got to think that many steps ahead as well and, and to think about, you know, it, if stuff... Uh, gets passed and then gets rescinded, does that, you know, how does that affect everything going forward? So there's a lot to really consider. Um, and, and, and I guess, you know, when I talk about those two hats for politicians, I mean, I, I guess we also consider that, well, that we've got two hats as well in one way is that part of what we need to do is build success in Parliament. And because animal issues are so far behind, um, there's a lot of areas where we can gain some of those successes and hopefully there are things like the crush videos, like the domestic violence areas, the areas that will stick, that will start to build momentum. Um, but the other part of what we do is also um, building the party and building that platform because we want to ensure that we do maintain um, our seats because we need to have those votes to be able to remain in a position of power within Parliament. Um, and so we need to make sure that that effectiveness remains in Parliament. If, if we end up losing both seats, then obviously there's no voice for animals in Parliament again. Um, hopefully we won't get there. I, I don't want to sort of be pessimistic either. Um, but I think, you know, and, and that, that comes into when we're doing our campaigns. And so, you know, when I gave all that detail around those the crush videos, it's about making sure, you know, we've got the, the investigation, we've got the evidence that this is an issue through that open source investigation. We've got the legal backing for an opinion for the legislation and then we need to take it through Parliament. Um, and hopefully all of that helps us to, to maintain the wins that we've got. Um, but, but it is important and it's one of those things you just constantly have to think two steps ahead, as, as you say. Yeah, and on a on a similar thread, I guess uh, is is there a risk that as we create better and better animal protection legislation and uh, have more success, that maybe some of the urgency that people might feel for animal rights or for veganism, or uh, I guess um, could people start to care less about animals if they think that there's less of an issue there? Um, do you, do would you agree with that? And if so, how how would um, how can we kind of counter that? I actually think it will work the other way around. I think that as we increase awareness, um, that we will reduce cognitive dissonance. So, for example, if I go back to the tougher penalties, I think that if we get tougher penalties for animal abuse, it recognises animal cruelty as a serious crime and it elevates animal cruelty as an issue within society. Um, you know, if we get wins for animals that are being um, used in entertainment, then we're essentially solidifying the fact that these animals deserve bodily autonomy and that we shouldn't be just using animals for entertainment. And when we talk about some of these wins, that's quite easily digestible information for the general public. And the more people become aware of, you know, and, and start to think, you're right, we should be um, making sure that the, the crime and, and the penalty match. We need to recognise how serious animal cruelty is. We need to stop using animals for these forms of entertainment. And then I think it just becomes more and more easy and more and more front of mind for people to start thinking about much bigger issues. You know, should we be consuming animals? 
should we be, um, you know, if we if we shouldn't be putting dolphins in backyard pools and forcing them to do tricks for us, should we be putting a pig in a stall where she can't take a step forward or backwards or turn around and then she's sent to a slaughterhouse, you know, where she has an absolutely horrific and uh, terrifying death? Is that okay? Um, so I think it actually grows the movement because I think that it increases the consciousness of, um, amongst the general population about animal issues. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, some some legislation reforms focuses specifically on changing the way that farmed animals live, which um, you've talked a little bit about. So, f- for example, things like banning battery cages for, for chickens. Uh, many of these changes are things that um, I guess they seem obviously better from a human perspective, at least, like a, a human would certainly prefer those things. But how do we know that non-humans would actually prefer it? Um, we obviously can't ask them, so we have to find other ways to... Um, think about that because it, there might be some things that a human would prefer that a non-human of some species might not. So how do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, look, I often just defer to the science on that. We, we did have a, an inquiry on the use of battery cages in the, um, in the egg industry and there was a lot of scientific research that came forward within that, within all the welfare groups and they talked about a welfare ceiling and they talked about the evidence of distress and they talked about the evidence of pain um, you know, recently when I was um, talking about um, including cephalopods and crustaceans as, as animals under the Act, I was able to talk about some of the science that shows that these animals do experience pain and the fact that they have pain receptors um, on their skin and that also that where there is negative stimuli, they actively make a decision to avoid it in all future situations. So we know that these animals experience distress. We know that they experience pain and we know that they desire to avoid it. So I, I rely on a lot of the, silent, uh, the science on that. Um, but, of course, the, the other side of that as well is, you know, that a lot of these bigger picture issues um, are also having major effects on the environment. They're having major effects on human health. And there's a lot of science to back us up on that stuff as well. And so, you know, there's that real bigger picture work around transformation. I talked a little bit about that in regards to subsidies within the dairy industry, but where government needs to switch from this model of subsidising industries and propping up industries that actually use and abuse animals um, for all of those reasons, human health, environment and animal protection, and start moving to... Um, a model that doesn't interfere with animals and, and changes our recognition of having this sort of ownership of animals to recognising that they're another species and they have just as much right to be here on Earth without interference as, as, as we as humans as another species do. So it's also about moving and shifting some of that attention towards transformation projects um, and away from animal use altogether. Um, And I think that that kind of, I guess it kind of goes over and above some of that scientific stuff about, you know, what what do animals desire and actually says, well, you know, our interaction with the earth and with other creatures on the earth is is a much bigger consideration. Mm. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. So, yeah, we've talked about some some tough topics and been a bit pessimistic, which (laughs) I think is important, but it's also important to stay upbeat and to count our wins. Uh, And yeah, I guess you've already talked, um, you've already spoken quite a bit about some of the successes you've had in Parliament, but um, just to finish off with an upbeat note, um, what do you think, um, so first, what do you think are your top wins from the last year? If you want to just rehash those a little bit um, or or we can skip over that if you think you covered that enough. And also, what are you hopeful about for, you've got six years left in your, in your first term. Um, So, yeah, what are you most hopeful about for those next six years? Um, so, I, I mean, some of our biggest wins, um, you know, we've had um, obviously those domestic violence and animal abuse legislation changes. We're working on more in that space um, this year as well. We had um, five councils go fur free. Um, so, again, working on that whole fur issue. Um, which is something that's just been dragging out here in, in Australia and the fact that fur is still being sold. Um, we've had the tougher penalties legislation come up. 
Um, so we're looking at much tougher penalties for acts of animal abuse. Um, yeah, th th there's been quite a lot of wins um, and, and there's a lot more going forward as well. Um, and look, there's a lot of campaigns that we're taking on this year around crush videos, which we've mentioned a little bit about. Um, another big one for us will be shark nets um, and the use of shark nets and, and, and trying to get rid of those. So there's a lot of areas where we think we're going to potentially see a lot of change. But I think what excites me most is um, is that real bigger picture stuff that, that we've also been talking about um, and looking into transformation. And, I mean, look, I, I don't think that probably within six years we'll, we'll see this major shift in the model, but I do, I am hopeful that, you know, this is stuff that has never been brought up in Parliament and it's one of those things where it has to start somewhere and it may as well start with us. We've also been working on a piece of legislation around speciesism um, again, it's one of those issues that I don't think anybody has ever considered before. We ended up putting up, oh, I can't remember how many notices of motion last year, but we covered almost every aspect of the animal agribusiness and every aspect of animal cruelty. And so every week that we did notices of motion, I got up and gave multiple every day. And the number of MPs that came up to me and just said, I had never heard about this or I didn't know... I didn't know they macerated male chicks in the egg industry. I didn't know that they killed the bobby calves in the dairy industry. I wasn't aware that um, octopuses weren't included in POCTA. Like we went through every single issue and um, because it's a notice of motion, that happens first thing in the morning and so everybody's down the house and it kind of put every single issue on the agenda and made people start to think about some of these issues. So, you know, like a lot of our work is is really about making sure the conversations start. And so I'm quite excited about the idea of legislation around speciesism um, and all the work that we're going to be doing around transformation as well. Yeah, great. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what um, you can achieve over the next six years and hopefully um, even further than that. So uh, do you have anything else to add before we wrap up? Anything else you think might be interesting? Um, I guess just if people are interested in getting involved with the Animal Justice Party or are interested in finding out more about politics, um, to, to reach out to the state office to become a member and, and actually look into getting involved with the regional groups. So our regional groups, um, I, I did a few of the fur bans myself and then the regional groups literally took over and were able to get council fur bans. Um, we need more councils to have fur bans. Um, and then the Shark Nets campaign, again, will be predominantly run by these regional groups. So, you know, if you are interested in getting involved on that political level for campaigning, then, um, you know, reach out to your regional group and get involved. Great. Yeah, thank you for adding that. And I was also going to ask about uh, where people can find more information about your work specifically if they're interested. Absolutely. So I've got a website, emmahurstmp.com. Um, we've also got a Facebook page. My Facebook page is updated pretty much daily. Um, and then, of course, there's Twitter and Instagram as well. So reach out to us on there, send us any emails and questions, um, and, yeah, get involved. Great. So, yeah, we'll have links to all of that, uh, uh, the Animal Justice Party and your pages in the description for the podcast so people can find Great. that there. Uh, I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. So thank you so much, Emma. I really appreciate your time. And I think it's been a really interesting chat. Um, and yeah, I hope our listeners get a lot out of it. Great. Fantastic. Thanks, Michael. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Please send me your feedback to mdello at hotmail.com or on our Facebook page, Morality is Hard. And please also send any suggestions for topics to discuss next time or any recommended guests for the future. So thanks again and until next time.